At the end of our previous lecture, we had left off with the following cliffhanger. You have a chain complex uh, of the form CD, which means um, you have C0, which is a chain group in dimension 0, C1, C2, and there's a zero map, or just call it D0, and then D1, D2, D3, with the property that uh, BK plus 1 uh, followed by BK equals 0 for all K. So, um, and what we want um, uh, is to compute homology. And um, if all you care about are the, so here's what we have. And what we wanted is to compute the homology groups, H, K of C, D. Um, and if all you wanted was to learn the dimensions of these homology groups as vector spaces over some field F, where um, all these chain groups are vector spaces over that, um, if that's all you wanted to do, then, um, then we have a recipe. You need just the ranks of the BIs and the dimensions of the chain groups. So that's it. You've computed the vector space because you know its dimension. If you want to dig a little bit deeper, though, um, you want to understand what simplices are giving rise to elements of uh, the homology group. Now, that's a difficult question to uh, make precise geometrically because the elements of the homology group are going to be quotients of chains by other chains, which means you won't get precise lists of simplices. In general, you get linear combinations of simplices. But still, it's good to know which simplices were involved. So quick uh, recap. This is uh, group is the kernel of dk, quotient, the image of dk plus 1. And so we will try to get a basis for kernel dk quotient image dk plus 1 in terms of uh, chains in ck. Uh, so that's the goal of this lecture. And all we need is a little bit of basic linear algebra. Um, and since I don't want to assume that people are um, overly familiar with linear algebra, just enough to, you know, be dangerous. Uh, so recall, if you are given a matrix uh, A i j of size uh, n cross m, so there are n rows and n columns, then you can put it in what's called reduced row echelon form by performing row operations. So um, there were three types of row operations. The type you use most frequently are row i gets row i plus some multiple of row j, where alpha must be something in your field uh, not equal to zero. Um, I guess you could make alpha equal to zero, but then you wouldn't change anything. B, um, so let's get rid of that. Um, B, you could uh, interchange two rows. And C, you could scale a row. So you could get Ri the new ra is alpha times ri for some alpha not equal to zero in that. So these were three row operations, um, and I'll call them standard row ops. Um, and of course, you can easily imagine having um, uh, exactly the same three such operations for columns which is what you'd use to put the transpose of A into, um, uh, into echelon form. So all we are going to need are these two types of um, row operations. So 
here is the main um, linear algebra diagonalization that we will use. Remember, we wanted to diagonalize all of these boundary matrices. So here's the theorem, and now we have to be a little bit careful about what we call it. Um, if instead of f, uh, if instead of f we had z or z, which is the ring, not field of integers, then this is called Smith normal form. Aside from that, it doesn't really have a name. I think it, it goes back to Gauss. But anyway, so I'm going to call it the Smith normal form, even though we're not working with integers. Uh, anyway, here it is. Let A from, um, let's see, M dimensional space to N dimensional space be a matrix of rank R. And now, by definition, R has to be less than or equal to the min of M and N. It cannot be more than those two. Then, there exist invertible matrices. P and Q. Um, I guess I should tell you um, where they go. So P is going to end up going from Fn to Fn, and Q is going to go from Fn to Fn. So as things stand for us right now, A is, an, is a matrix with n rows and m columns, uh, and it has rank R, and P is n by n because it is invertible, and Q is n by m, it's also invertible. Uh, and these matrices satisfy B equals P A Q. So this is a matrix equation. Right now, I'm just saying I can multiply these three and get a matrix D. That's not helpful. We knew that already based on their sizes. So D has a special structure. Um, it looks like this. So in the upper left, so it has four blocks. In the upper left block, it has the identity matrix, the, the uh, matrix with ones along the diagonal and zeros everywhere else of size r by r, and everything else is zero. So um, this is called, this D is called the Smith normal form of A. And when we work over um, z coefficients, you don't get the identity in the upper left corner, we get a different diagonal matrix. Um, so that the diagonal entries, each one divides the next. Over a field, this is not going to matter. So you can ignore everything written in gray on the right and just think of this as a Smith normal form of a matrix with field coefficients. Okay, what's the point of this decomposition? The point is we um, have defined kernels uh, our, our, the thing we want to get is kernel mod image. And what this decomposition does is it puts the kernel and image of A in a very, very easy to extract form. So this is what it looks like. Um, first of all, I'm going to write uh, things a little bit differently. So let's write P inverse D equals um, AQ, which since P is invertible, instead of writing D equals P A Q, we can just write P inverse D equals A Q. And now let's think about what's happening. So here's P inverse. It's some matrix, and I guess we know that it has N rows and N columns. Um, it's multiplied by this matrix D, which has to have the same shape as A. So this guy is going to have um, n rows and m columns. So there it is. There's D. And remember, D has our special block structure with the identity on the upper left. And then zeros everywhere else. Okay, this thing is equal to A times Q. 
whatever um, whatever that is. Um, okay, so what do we know about Q? Well, we know that Q is of size n by n. And of course, A is of size uh, n by n. Okay, now the important thing to focus on is this identity block here uh, in B. Now, the fact that this identity block uh, is in the upper left corner means that everything that P inverse D hits, the non-zero stuff that you can get with P inverse D, is going to live in the first R columns. So R, M minus R. Everything this matrix can actually get non-zero values for lives here. So these first R columns, one, two, three, whatever they are, these contain a basis for the image of A. And conversely, what's going to happen is on the right-hand side, if you look at the last M minus R columns, so here's R, here's M minus R, uh, those last M minus R columns of Q are going to contain a basis for the kernel of A. So this is the fundamental decomposition, and it's useful because it gives us a nice way to package the kernel and image uh, of A. And you should check that everything I've put in there has the correct dimension. Um, the kernel of A, if A has rank R by the rank nullity theorem, has dimension M minus R. The image of A obviously has rank R. It's a subspace of Fn, which is true. The kernel is a subspace of Fm, which is again true. So uh, at least in terms of counting things, this makes sense. Okay, so what do we remember is that the first R columns of P inverse contain the image of A, or at least the basis for the image of A, and the last M minus R columns of Q contain a basis for the kernel of A. And this is what we use. First, though, um, since I've talked about computing homology, the question is, how do you actually compute the Smith decomposition? So computing Smith normal form. So, uh, okay, so the correct answer is you, you ask your computer to do it for you. But uh, the complete answer is I should at least tell you what the computer would do on a sort of reasonably tractable matrix. So uh, to make things interesting, let's choose uh, an example of a not very large matrix, um, of not very large rank. So let's say A is 1, 1, 3, and then 2, 2, 6. Why have I chosen this? Because uh, three columns and two rows is small, and one row is a multiple of the other, so I know that the rank is going to be 1. So uh, here, um, m equals 3, n equals 2, and r equals 1. So keep that in mind. OK, so the idea is exactly, that's a terrible icon for idea. What I was trying to draw was a light bulb. Let's see if we get it right second time around. That looks kind of like a light bulb. So here's the idea, is you do Gaussian elimination but allow both row and column operations. So Anytime you're in reduced row echelon form, you have a pivot one and you've cleared out you know, the entire column, everything above and below the one is cleared out because you are allowed to do row operations. But to the right, you're allowed to have some junk, um, some numbers that you weren't able to clear out. Well, the good news is um, now you're allowed column operations. So that one is useful, not just for you know, clearing out its entire column, but also for clearing out its entire row. And you can do all of this at once. So, uh, so the idea is you start with a block matrix B, which has um, an identity of type n by n, then A, 
then identity of m by m, and then here 0. So, and then use row and column operations to diagonalize A. So you only ever want to do these rows and those columns. But as you manipulate the rows, the n by n identity matrix on the left changes. As you manipulate the columns, the identity matrix on the n by n uh, changes. So when this A block is diagonalized, you are left with, let's call this final matrix B prime. Uh, it's going to have this lovely form P, D, Q. And of course, you never touched the zeros, so the zero stays. So you can do everything all at once. Um, and I don't know if I'm going to get to the end of uh, computing the Smith normal form of RA, but let's see how far we get. So, Take a deep breath, prepare your, uh, your computers or your pencils or whatever you're going to use to compute this. Uh, and, and here is A. So our matrix, our block matrix B, is going to have 1, 0, 0, 1 here. And then this matrix A. And then another identity downstairs. And then a big fat 0. And let's sort of keep the block structure so we see what's going on. OK, so maybe the first move you'd want to make with this type of matrix is, um, oh, I don't know. We know that the second row is um, uh, of the A part, you know, the upper right corner. The, a, the second row is twice the first row. So I guess one reasonable thing to do is the row operation, R2 gets R2 minus twice R1. So what that's going to do to our matrix, let me just copy it down and then I'll change the things that have to be changed. Copy, just so we don't waste time watching me write it all again, is this becomes zero, the 226 part. So let's highlight it in a different color. And because you subtracted twice the front, first one from the second one, uh, you end up with minus two here. So that, that row has changed. Um, the next move you might want to make, uh, so that, that move was made to basically make the one a pivot. So you wanted this one to become a pivot, so you wanted to get rid of this two. And that's all we did, and very conveniently everything else zeroed out, but of course that won't happen if you didn't have a rank one matrix to begin with. Okay, now I guess I would like to kill this one over here. So uh, the correct thing to do here is to take um, uh, column one, two, three, four, and give it column four minus column one. Uh, and hopefully you see how this goes, right? So the, the this part, minus two, one, stays the same. Um, the zeros, of course, never really cared about us, so they're going to stay the same. Um, and over here, you get one, zero, 1, 0, 0, that's going to stay the same. 3, 0, we didn't touch that row. Okay, what actually ends up changing is this column. So here you get 0, 0, and minus 1 from the left side, 1, 0. Okay, so you keep doing this, and at the end, um, you will get the desired P, D, 0, Q. And in fact, we know exactly what D is going to be, so let's write it. Uh, the D is going to have the form 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So that's the D. Okay, good. So let's say now if someone throws a matrix at you, you can compute the Smith normal form, or even better yet, program a computer to do this for you. Good. So when you're done with that, it's time to ask yourself how to compute the basis for homology that we wanted. So here is the basic idea. So let C D be a chain complex. And we're going to assume 
the dimension of each C is. So each CK is NK, is less than infinity, and the rank of DK is RK, which because all the vector spaces have uh, dimension less than infinity, the rank of this matrix has also got to be less than infinity. Okay, um, let, um, let's call big DK equals PK little d QK be the Smith normal form. of little dk. Okay, then set. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a block matrix where on one side of it, we want a basis for the image of dk plus 1. And on the other side, we want a basis for the kernel of dk because on the right-hand side is the big vector space. On the left-hand side is the small vector space that we want to quotient out to get the homology groups. So, well, if you don't remember what goes where, you just scroll up a little bit to the handy little chart. So scroll, 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 scroll. And here it is. The Q matrix contains the basis for the kernel. The P inverse matrix contains the basis for the image. So what you have to put here are um, the last n k minus r k columns of q k, and what you have to put here on the left side are the first r k plus one columns of p k plus one inverse. Great. So now on the left side, you have a basis for the small vector space that you want to crush. On the right hand side, you have the uh, basis for the giant vector space whose quotient you want to compute. And so if you let E prime be the reduced row echelon form of EK, so again, let me remind you, this means no column operations allowed. We never want to switch any columns because we want to remember what was in the image and what was in the kernel, otherwise we're lost. So no column operations allowed. Then the pivot columns on the right side, which is to say this side that I've put a big fat star on, uh, give you a basis for the kth homology group of the chain complex. And of course, this doesn't care about whether it came from a simplicial complex or not. But if it did, then uh, that basis on the right-hand side would be linear combinations of uh, elements in CK, which is the K chain group. So they'd just be linear combinations of K simplices. So if you really want it, you could go back into your simplicial complex and look at which simplices were involved in generating homology. And this will be a useful thing to do later on.